The Kurds, they're the world's largest ethnic group without a country. They're spread across one of the most volatile regions in the world, and you've definitely heard of them. Kurdish militias across Iraq and Syria have gained some popularity in the United States, but there still isn't much support for an independent Kurdish state. Why is that the case? Well, it's complicated. Hey guys, I'm Sana, this is AJ Plus, and today I wanna talk about why making a Kurdish state happen is gonna be tough. So the Kurds have been getting a lot of international attention in the last few years because of their role in the conflicts in Iraq and Syria. Kurdish militias have been battling ISIS, Syrian rebels, the Iraqi and Syrian governments to stake claim to land and to also protect Kurdish communities. And in October 2017, Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan took part in a referendum in which 93% of those who voted chose independence. But the Iraqi government called the referendum illegal and non-binding. And while the referendum was considered a big moment in Kurdish political history, what happened in Iraqi Kurdistan didn't necessarily represent the direction of all Kurdish people. And Deniz Akici, a lecturer at UC Berkeley, breaks down why that's the case. There is no single Kurdish independence movement. After the World War I, Kurdistan was divided into four uh, nation states, Iran, Iraq, Turkey and Syria. So with that, let's roll back a bit and look at how the Kurds have ended up where they are today. The Kurds are the fourth largest ethnic group in the region and make up sizable minority populations across Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Despite having big numbers, they didn't get their own state after the fall of the Ottoman Empire when the United Kingdom and France were busy carving up the region. The infamous Sykes-Picot Agreement split the Ottoman Empire into nation states, but it didn't really care about how ethnically diverse the region actually was. The Kurds, left out of Sykes-Picot, had negotiated their own state under the Treaty of Sev, but that didn't work out. The treaty was supposed to split modern-day Turkey into different zones, including one for the Kurds. But it wasn't ratified, thanks to when Turkish nationalists led by Kemal Ataturk, Turkey's first president, recaptured all of modern Turkey from the Europeans. Fast forward to the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when we start seeing countries across the region gain independence from European colonialism. A huge part of pushing back against European colonialism was the cultivation of various nationalisms, Pan-Arabism for instance, Turkey's Kemalism, or Iranian nationalism. All of this meant that Kurdish sovereignty was either not a priority for Pan-Arabist leaders in Iraq and Syria, or was a threat for Kemalist Turkey and for Iran. That meant that over the 20th century, the Kurds across these four countries saw a lot of marginalization. There was displacement, political repression, loss of rights, and massacres. And it's not as though the Kurds didn't resist the repression. Time and time again, they did. Now, the brunt of the state violence faced by Kurds was in Turkey and Iraq. In Turkey, the government forcibly displaced over a million Kurds after several Kurdish revolts in the 1920s and 30s. Kurdish language and culture was banned, and violence against the Kurdish population, including torture and destruction of villages, was widespread. Kurds in Iraq saw the height of state repression in the late 80s and early 90s. Under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi government oversaw several massacres of Kurdish civilians during the Iran-Iraq war. The government accused Kurdish fighters along the Iranian border of assisting the Iranians and led what was called the Unfall Campaign. It lasted two years and claimed thousands of Kurdish lives by the end of the 1980s. Iraq in the 90s saw the first Gulf War, a Kurdish civil war, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi deaths as a result of the international sanctions. Then we get to the early 2000s where there was the American invasion of Iraq. So that brings us now to today, a push for Kurdish independence and the resistance to it. Iraqi Kurdish journalist Abdullah Hawais told me how it's important to think of Kurdistan as more than just a political aspiration. So the idea of having a Kurdish state is not only a political dream, it's actually part of the culture of Kurds, it's part of their identity. They have been raised with thinking that Kurds deserve a state. So who's standing in the way? Let's start with Turkey and Iran. Iran and, and Turkey are very much uh, against the establishment of a Kurdish state um, even outside of their borders because they fear that if there is a Kurdish political entity anywhere in the Middle East, this would threaten the so-called national unity of these two countries. 
Turkey considers groups like the PKK, aka the Kurdistan Workers' Party, to be terrorist groups and threats to national security. Turkey also fears an independent Kurdish state in Iraq would be used as a base for the PKK to launch attacks on the Turkish military and civilian populations. Turkish nationalists see Kurdish aspirations inside its borders and outside as a threat to, well, Turkish state identity. Remember I mentioned how back in the 1930s, Kurds were barred in Turkey from speaking their own language and practicing their own culture? Well, it was only in 2012 that they were allowed to teach their own language and culture in private schools. Then there's Iran. Iran also has no interest in seeing an independent Kurdish state given its own Kurdish population in the country's northwest as well as its relationship with Iraq. Currently, Iran has very close relations with the Iraqi government, seeing it as a buffer between itself and hostile regional neighbors. A Kurdish state that would be seen as friendly to the United States and Israel isn't exactly the most tantalizing thought for the Iranians. Then we've got Iraq and Syria, both embroiled in conflict. Following the Kurdish referendum, the Iraqi government responded by launching an offensive to take the city of Kirkuk, which had been under Kurdish control since 2014. Huwais, by the way, says that Kirkuk is central to Kurdish statehood. Kirkuk is considered a vital part of any Kurdish project for statehood, not only because of its uh, wealth and its oil, which is actually very important for, for any, any Kurdish state, especially economically, but also historically, Kurds think without Kirkuk, a Kurdish state would be very poor, even culturally. Then there's Syria, where Kurds have seen some reforms in recent years and where Kurdish forces have been integral in the battle against ISIS. In 2011, as protests were spreading across Syria, the government granted around 300,000 undocumented Kurd citizenship, citizenship that was stripped back in 1962. But Syria's Kurds are seeking a federal system in the country similar to Iraqi Kurdistan's autonomous position. As for the Americans, while they've supported the Kurds throughout the decades, they don't actually support a Kurdish state. According to the official line, a Kurdish state in Iraq, where the movement is the strongest, would mean further destabilization of a vital U.S. ally. But its closest ally in the region, Israel, has actually been vocally supportive of an independent Kurdish state. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sees Kurdistan as a potential ally for Israel in a region where it feels surrounded by, well, not that many allies. So what is the likelihood of there being a Kurdish state anytime soon or at all? Well, according to Hawais, not too likely. Kurds have realized without have seeking uh, um, support from the regional and international power, it's almost impossible to build a state, especially that Kurdistan is a small region and it's landlocked, surrounded by hostile countries. So for that, it's, it's very difficult to build a state without building a strong diplomatic apparatus. It's also worth noting that not all Kurdish populations follow the Iraqi Kurdish movement for independence per se. When you look at other parts of Kurdistan, for instance, uh, the Turkish part, the Syrian part, in those parts too, Kurdish nationalist movement is not asking for independence actually. They are seeking a solution within the existing borders. So they are trying to democratize the state so that you know, Kurds would have a favorable environment. And as Akiji also says, that lack of political cohesion is because of weak leadership. It has a lot to do with uh, the fragmentation of the Kurdish society along uh, tribal, uh, regional and linguistic lines. And again, the inability of the Kurdish leadership to bring all the segments together uh, to create one voice which would carry the Kurds to uh, a nationhood. The Kurds have a long history of not only marginalization, but of resisting that marginalization. But given how the Kurdistan region is surrounded by hostile countries, lacks political cohesion, and even agreement on the nation's future, it's not very likely that the world's largest nation without a state will be getting one anytime soon. Mm -hmm.